Um, the purpose of me showing that is just to kind of undergird this notion of the roles that stories can play in regards to passing down knowledge, right? So the theme of that particular story is how I was introduced into James Baldwin and how I continue to introduce James Baldwin to my students, um, how I will introduce my children to James Baldwin and how the work of James Baldwin just continues to live on um, from generation to generation. Um, so we'll jump into Going to Meet the Man. Uh, this is the book that we read the story from. So this book is a collection of essays that James Baldwin uh, produced. This was published, I wanna say 1940 something. Let me double check. I thought I wrote that down, but I guess not. Um, kind of give you guys a temporal context as to when this was produced. Um, 1948, yeah, so the original publication came out in 1948. So this is when this is uh, produced. Um, let me see, actually, I got one more, there we go. All right. So think about the role and the importance of story as you kind of, as we work through this, right? But what is Baldwin doing with this particular story is a question that popped into my mind, right? Um, so before I get too deep into it, like, the story had a lot of shit going on, right? It's a lot of sexual in the in, in, in your windows. Um, we're dealing with a very um, explicit topic and subject matter as we, we're talking about this town who's engaging in a lynching, right? So it's a lot going on with the story. So that's the what, that's what's being talked about. But what I'm more interested in, I want you, what I want you guys to think about is the how, right? How does he talk about these things that are within the pages of going to meet the man? Um, when dealing with Baldwin, and not, not just this story in particular, but any of Baldwin's work, uh, we'll be reading Baldwin again next week. Um, there's two pillars, what he calls the two pillars of white supremacy, what I'm going to call the two pi pillars of white inferiority. Um, can somebody explain to me or explain to the class, what is the purpose of a pillar? What is a pillar meant to do? Doesn't, doesn't like a pillar support structure or something of some kind? Galilee, that's, a, that's a great way to articulate that, right? It supports a structure. So what Baldwin is saying, there's two pillars that's going to support this structure of white inferiority, okay? Um, the first pillar being the white imagination. The second pillar being the maintenance of white innocence. So you definitely want to write these down. So the two pillars for uh, white inferiority, according to James Baldwin, is the white imagination and the um, maintenance or to maintain white innocence, okay? So when I think about the white imagination, I, I think the greatest personification of the white imagination could be found in Hollywood, could be found in movies, right? Because essentially what a movie is, is something that comes from someone's imagination and they have the money and the resources to manifest that onto the what they call the silver screen, right? Um, so going with this theme, is anybody familiar or heard of the film, A Birth of a Nation? Uh, Kaylin, so there's actually two Birth of a Nation. I should, should have been more specific. Um, not the one done by Nate Parker, but the original Birth of a Nation. So there's one done um, by Nate Parker who tells the story of um, Nat Turner. Um, there's another more historic Birth of a Nation, the original Birth of a Nation that was done by D.W. Griffith. And I want to say in the early 1900s. Uh, Kayleen, were you talking about the first or the second one? I believe it was the first uh, film. Okay. If if I'm correct, it was the one where they point, uh, they painted white people as like the saviors or something, yeah. right? Yeah, that's that one. one. Yep, that's the one. Oh yeah, I I heard of it and. Oh. Okay, so for those who have not seen it, um, I'm pretty sure if you're gonna take a film class, you'll, you'll come across it. Um, in junior college, I took a film class and we had to watch it for the film class. And then when I got to Cal State LA, I took another film class, I had to watch it for that film class. It's probably one of the most widely recognized film in American history. Um, in fact, when it first came out, it went on tour. Um, and then also, um, yeah, 1915, thank you. And then also when it came out in 1915, they showed it in the White House, okay? So the premise of the film, it's, it's post reconstruction, okay? So keep in mind, reconstruction is when the end of enslavement takes place. And 
you know, for a brief time, African people are given the ability to vote, right? And because of them having the ability to vote, they're able to vote Black folks into political offices. So how the movie depicts this period. So when they show the Black people who are obtaining office, seats of political office, they show them with their feet on the desk. They show them eating watermelon and fried chicken. Just this real um, derogatory depiction of what it would look like if Black people were to assume positions of political power. Okay, So that's one theme of the, theme of the film. Um, the other theme of the film is this um, black man who is pursuing this white woman to, to rape her, right? But in his pursuit, in her attempts to free herself, she jumps off of a cliff not to be raped, right? So because of this activity, the Ku Klux Klan is birthed and they give rise and they're able to right the wrongs of the city and kind of put things back in order, okay? So again, this is most the most widely recognized film in American history. Um, this is a film that was being shown in the White House, right? So again, this white imagination producing films that depict Black people in a certain way. Also within the film, there's no Black actors in the film, right? The people who are depicted as Black are actually white individuals who are, are in Blackface, right? So, so this is, again, America's most well-known and well-recognized film, right? Think about the themes of the film. And then for me, um, growing up in the 90s, when I think about Black film, um, we have the Boys in the Hood, we have the Men in Societies, um, we have all what you call the gangster genre of film, right? So that was really prevalent in my era. In my era. Um, being from California and moving and living outside of California, right? Everybody would ask me, yo, is LA really, is it gangbanging really like that in LA, right? So, I, and I bring this up just to show you that these ideas and these repeti repetitions that are depicted on film, they travel really more than black people are able to travel in a sense, right? Because Boys in the Hood is viewed in China, Russia, it's global, right? It's a, it's a movie that's be able to transfer, transfer globally, okay? So this imagination has created an image of the black body that should be feared, right? It should be feared from, by women because of the threat of rape. It should be um, feared by anyone else because they're hyper violence, okay? This is what's depicted in these films, the white imagination. Um, another way that we see the white imagination play out, and I'm gonna try to link this to the intersection between the white imagination and the maintenance of white innocence. Um, Oscar Grant, George Floyd, um, Michael Brown, I could go on, right? These are all black individuals who were murdered at the hands of the police. In each one of those circumstances, the police officer always articulates he was afraid for his life. Correct me if I'm wrong, if that's not the case. But this is what they say. I was afraid of my, for my life, white imagination. Let's think about what a police officer is. You're trained, right, to go out in the street and to keep the peace. And I'll put that in air quotes because we all know that's not what they do. Um, you also are tactically prepared, right? You have a gun, you have pepper spray, you have handcuffs, you have bulletproof vests, you have batons, some of you have dogs, right? You have the ability to call for backup. Nine times out of 10, you're engaging in individuals who are unarmed, right? And if they are armed, you are more armed than they are, okay? Y'all with me on that? So what I'm getting at is how justifiable is this fear, right? Furthermore, you signed up to be what? A police officer, that's your job, right? That's the equivalent of me saying, you know, I had to whoop these students ass because I'm afraid of them. That doesn't make sense. I signed up to be a professor, right? So how can you be afraid of the public who you seek to engage, okay? white imagination, okay? So what happens is as these play out and it goes to court, right? And the police officer is let free, what is the term that they use to give these police officers their freedom? It's a term that's used consistently in all these circumstances. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So for those who've seen The Hate You Give, um, Zara's pointing out the similarities in that. You're absolutely right. Um, but with the term that is used is justifiable homicide, right? So what I'm talking about is murder, 
It's cold-blooded murder. But how the state, and when I say the state, I don't mean California, I mean the government apparatus, right? How the state allows these individuals to continuously murder and not see any type of jail or any type of punishment is due to the term justifiable homicide. And that homicide becomes justifiable because of the fear that is prevalent within these police officers, right? This fear that stems from the white imagination, right? This fear that says anybody occupying a black epidermis, anyone who has brown skin, should be viewed as a threat, right? Regardless of what type of armor or arms you have, this right here supersedes all of the training that you received, all of the military tactics that you have, right? All that's thrown out the window because you're justified in your fear of that black body due to how the white imagination has depicted the black body. Y'all with me on that? So that's one pillar of how Baldwin articulates how we're able to maintain the system of white inferiority, right? The white imagination. The second pillar is the maintenance of white innocence, right? So although you're going throughout the world through this term manifest destiny, enslaving three-fourths of the world's population, right? You're not viewed as inhuman. You're not viewed as sadistic. You're not viewed as archaic and humane, right? Because what? You're doing God's work, right? God gave me the idea that says I should go out and bring these people civilization. I should go out and bring these heathens Christianity, right? So what does that do? It maintains their innocence. Right, because now I'm not being a terrorist, I'm being a missionary, right? So it maintains their innocence, right? The example I just gave with the police officers, justifiable homicide maintains their innocence, right? Because in all other accounts, it's murder. Trayvon Martin, was the murderer of Trayvon Martin, was he a police officer? Before I get too far, do y'all know who Trayvon Martin is and do you understand the, the, the dynamics of that situation? Does anybody not know? Let me phrase it that way. Anybody unfamiliar with Trayvon Martin's scenario? Okay, so no one's unfamiliar. So the uh, murderer of Trayvon Martin is George Zimmerman, okay? Was George Zimmerman a police officer? To answer my own question, no, he was not. He was not a police officer. In fact, when he saw Trayvon walking through his neighborhood and he called the police, the police told him to stand down, okay? He said, do not pursue, do not follow, get back in your car. This is what the police told him to do, okay? So he still took it upon himself to act as a deputized citizen and pursue this young man, right? But again, when he gets to court, stand your ground, justifiable homicide and self-defense were the legal apparatus that allowed him to maintain his innocence, okay? So these are the two pillars that Baldwin articulates that holds up this system of white inferiority. And you'll see it play out through in the pages of this text. Um, also within the text, the over-sexualization of the black body is also played out, right? And it's also um, dealt with with terrorism and think about towards the end of the story, what I mean by that. Um, I think also this is an interesting story because of the protagonist of the story is a white man, right? Um, Jesse, and, and we are introduced into Jesse um, while he's in his bed with his wife and in his inability to perform his manly duties, right? Um, this is how we're in, uh, um, introduced into Jesse's character. And as he's thinking about his inability to perform, he thinks about um, how he can't treat his wife like he does the black women on the other side of the town when he goes to arrest them, right? Essentially when he rapes black women on the black side of town, he can't do that to his wife, right? So we, this is things that are playing out in Jesse's head. Um, has anybody heard of the term subversion? To be subversive. So this notion of being subversive is to undermine, um, to outsmart, to outthink, to outwit those who are in authority of you, right? So subversion could be in this space, right? Um, 
I shoot the professor an email or a quick DM saying, yo, I'm having um, internet issues, right? My line keeps cutting out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close out my camera to see if it gets any better. Oh no, my line is still cutting out. So I'm going to log out because I have really bad internet. But all along, your internet is perfectly fine, right? So you subverted your ability to be in this class by outsmarting me, the professor, to find an excuse to get you out of class, right? Um, subversion could look like in the plantation, right? Um, you need to pick at least 30 barrels of hay. I don't know, master, my, my arm has been really sore today. I don't know if I can get 30. I'm going to do what I can to get you 15. Right. I outsmarted my master in order to get me a position that's a little bit more comfortable. Subversions at play within the dynamics of Jesse and the characters that he comes into contact with on the black side of town. He says, you know, um, they tell me, yes, sir. So it makes him think that they like him. Right. So he's trying to reconcile the fact that, well, if they like me, why are they giving me such a hard time as a sheriff of this town? Right. They when they interact with me they say yes sir and they're cordial and they're polite right but then they'll come and protest and mess up my daily activities right so this notion of subversion right outsmarting outthinking outwitting those who are in power over you um jesse on page 236 he talks about how he perceives himself as a good person but then he he never really thinks about what it means to be a good person, right? So I'm, I'm gonna say that one more time. I really want you guys to think about this. Jesse understands himself to be a good person, but he never thought about what qualifies someone to be a good person, right? So that's the equivalent of me saying, you know, I think I'm good at basketball, but I don't know what it means to be good at basketball, right? So how, how could you really quantify, how could you determine whether you're a good person or not if you don't know what it means to be a good person, okay? the maintenance of white innocence, right? Because if I don't come to the realization that my actions are inhumane, I can trick myself into believing that I'm still a good person, right? So this is how ways that Jesse is maintaining his innocence. Um, another notion of the white, the maintenance of white innocence on page 237, he talks about the explosions that go off on the black side of town, right? Um, essentially what's happening is um, the white folks are bombing black homes, but then there's this fear that Jesse talks about and he says, I hope the explosives don't get in the wrong hands, right? I hope that the black folks don't get hold of the bombs and, and start blowing up houses on our side of town, right? So again, the white imagination creating a threat and a fear that's not even present. Who's the one doing the bombing? Jesse's side of town, right? They're going over to the black side of town and, and bombing them, but they're afraid of them being bombed, right? White imagination. Um, so who knows what a picnic is? Who knows this historical significance of the term picnic? Right. What, 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 what do you think you've heard of? Actually, since you mentioned spoke already, Kaylin, um, Ariana, what did what have you heard about the term picnic? Um, in high school, my English teacher explained it when we read the passage that it's um, used as a type of lynching, so white people would lynch um, African Americans. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a picnic essentially picking a nigga and hanging him, right? That's what a picnic is, and what Baldwin is articulating within these pages is a picnic, right? Um, the town coming out to view the happenings, right? Them drop, stopping over at Jesse's house and saying, you know what, I don't even bring no food, man. We got food for you. Just, you know, put on some clothes and let's be out so you don't miss it, right? Everybody's coming to view this, right? Also think about how um, the tradition of the picnic, right? This is something that Jesse's dad wanted to make sure he passes down to Jesse, right? He picked him up on his shoulders so he can make sure he sees what's happening. Right? And think about how it plays cognitively for Jesse. He never felt more in love with his father except in that moment, right? His mother never looked more beautiful, but in that moment, right? So think about what this does to Jesse's psyche, okay? So this is a tradition that is passed down. 
right? The people who were doing the cutting were Jesse's dad's friends that he looked up to, right? So these are the people who taught Jesse how to be a man, right? Were the people who were engaged in this process of protecting him. Um, also, I thought Jesse's friend Otis was important. Did anybody kind of pick up on, on necessary not not necessarily Otis, but Otis's absence, right? Because that's what Jesse talks about. Like, yo, where's Jesse? I'm sorry, where's Otis? I ain't seen Otis in two days, right? And it says there's a part of the story. Let me see. 243. Give me one second. Um, okay, so towards the bottom of, of 243, he talks about his relationship with Otis. And I'm gonna start where he says he had grown accustomed. He had grown accustomed for the solutions of such, of such mysteries to go to Otis. And so the mysteries that he's talking about, right? Anything dealing with race, he would go to Otis to help him understand what's going on. Because essentially what's happening before the part that I read, he's driving and he's noticing that the town was empty, right? And he's asking his parents like, yo, where are I noticed that one, where's Otis? You know, and they don't give him a real straight answer. But then he starts thinking like, man, all the blacks on this side of town is gone, right? So typically when he has these type of questions, the person that he'll go to to get answers would be Otis, right? So the, to me, that says something about the dynamics between the information that Otis is privy to and the information that Jesse has access to, right? So there's a disconnect there. Obviously, Otis knows a lot more than Jesse knows because Jesse has to go to Otis for answers, right? What is up with that? Why is that? Keep that in the back of your head. Um, and then, Okay, and then also on page 240, not actually on to page 247, Jesse asks the question, you know, what did the man do, right? The man who's being strung up in the tree, what did he do? And as if he had to do something guilty to be able to receive this. But anybody who knows the history of lynchings knows that that's not the case, right? You could just be at the wrong place at the wrong time, and that would justify you to be strung up and lynched, right? So this, even Jesse asking this question, what did he do? It does what? It maintains the innocence of the white community because he had to do something to deserve this, right? But we know better than that. Um, and then this idea of um, the crowd finishing with the fire started. Right. So I, I guess that he fell from the tree that kind of gets engulfed in the fire and then the crowd rushes to start snatching up body parts. Right. And he gives the um, articulation of the knife being um, swung, coming up and coming down and cutting off the biggest thing he ever saw. Right. He gives you this articulation. But have y'all, I, I don't, and you may not have seen that, but there's images of lynchings to where, actually, let me, I'll phrase it this way. There's this book by Sadia Hartman, it's called Scenes of Subjection. And there's a portion of the book where she takes out images of lynchings, right? And she removes the individual being lynched and focuses on the audience who are attending the lynching, right? And it gives you a really good idea of the mindset to a lot of the people who were attending and engaging in these activities, right? Smiles on their faces, right? Pure elation on their faces. They would attend a lynching as if we attend a sporting event, right? So this says something to the psychology of a society who could engage in these type of practices and not feel um, and feel okay with it, right? There's also, has anybody heard of the science of epigenetics? Epigenetics. There's a book by um, Joy DeGruy. It's entitled The Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And essentially the thesis of that book is the experiences that African went through in enslavement are passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. And those tragic experiences are within the DNA and within the fabric of people living and existing now, right? So another way to think about this, any trauma that my grandmother went through she passed that trauma down to my mother. 
And the trauma that my mother went through, she passed that down to me. The trauma that I went through is being passed down to my children, right? This is the science of epigenetics, okay? Now, the focus of the book is on how African people are passing down these traumatic experiences through their DNA, right? But if we take a step back, and a small portion of the book deals with how even the enslavers, right? The white folks who ran the plantation, they're passing down trauma in, in their DNA as well, right? So if we were to take this theory and apply it to what we just read, by and large, right? The people who Baldwin is articulating through the page of this book are passing their psychotic normative ways of engaging with certain type of people down to their children, who pass it down to their children, who pass it down to their children, right? So if epigenetics is to be true, this idea or this notion of being able to phase out white supremacy or white inferiority due to old age, we know that that's a misnomer, right? Because these things are being passed down through the genetic makeup and the DNA of individuals. We can't assume that it's only going through African people and not non-others, right? That's not, that's not how science works. So this is where this notion or this idea of epigenetics becomes somewhat fascinating when you look at what Baldwin is doing within the story of going to meet the man. Also the ending, so the beginning and the ending of the story, right? What he could not do at the start of the story and by reliving this moment, what it allowed him to do says something, right? So, and he's speaking explicitly to the intersection of um, terrorizing the black body and the sensual, the sensualness of power and the ability to terrorize, right? Because when he thought about that, he was able to perform with his wife, right? So Baldwin's not directly, but in, implicitly letting us know about this notion of terrorizing the black body and the um, sensuality of performing these acts of terror, right? It made Jesse feel like a man, right? To put it plainly, right? It allowed him to perform his manly duties in the bedroom, right? Having to go back to this moment, right? So what, what does that say about uh, to feel manly, you have to think about these type of things. Okay, so I'll put my um, lecture on hold. We'll jump into our fishbowl. Is there anybody who wants to volunteer for the fishbowl? And keep in mind, you could talk about what was discussed in your breakout room. You could talk about what I just mentioned right now, or you could just read from your journal. Um, it's totally uh, I want to volunteer. We got Dulce. Um, we'll get two more. Um, okay. Can we get okay. one more? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I will. Okay. Thank you. So we have Dulce, Zaria, and Galilee for our fishbowl. Um, did I miss anybody? Can I do it? Who, who said that? I'm sorry. I'm Kayla. Yes, absolutely. All right, so we have you all down and whoever wants to start it off, go ahead. I'll start off. Um, so what I understood or what we spoke about in the breakout room was that what stood out to us about the reading was how basically how African-Americans were afraid and also the, they were afraid of the whites and what stood out to me was the two pillars as you explained, which was um, white imagination and resilience with white innocence. And every example that you gave was actually, you know, it made us understand, it made me understand more about the reading. But yeah, that's it. Thank you, Dulce. All right. Um, going off of what Dulce said, um, I was confused in the beginning of the reading because I didn't know what perspective we were reading from or we were reading from, that. Um, from the African-American point of view or the white view, which is Jesse's um, point of view. And then what I talked in my, um, my discussion, my discussion page was that um, 
when he was in bed with his wife, he couldn't um, he couldn't accomplish what he had to as a man. So he had to, in a way, um, do fulfill his his fantasy that he was doing, raping um, African American women on the other side. And he he always just has his hatred towards um, black people, but when it comes for to, for something for him that he wants to do or get something done. He, he goes back to the moment that where everything started, where he first saw the first lynching. And I guess in a way that's like something that inspired him. And that's, that's the point of view that we get from him as a little kid and how that affected his, um, his whole persona in, as, a, as an adult. Good points, thank you. Um. Okay, so um, I kind of wanted to mention, like I agree with uh, Zaida, I believe it is. Um, I didn't know like whose perspective it was in the beginning. And then once I like figured it out that it was a white guy's, it just completely altered the way I was reading it because I feel like um, like colorism, you know, nowadays, especially with like women, I feel that a lot of white men, they kind of shame a lot of, uh, darker skinned women and but yet they tend to like fantasize a lot more like they you know they want girls with bigger butts and usually it's you know African women who have that you know with nice figures but then they wouldn't like dare go around and sleep with them with the black girl right mm -hmm. which I don't understand why it's just I think it's because they're they fear like what other men are going to say and the, and I know it's like men live to please other men like even though unknowingly which I think is really unfortunate because um a lot of guys grow up almost like ashamed of what they actually like so yeah that's what uh, stood out to me the most and um I also wanted to mention um oh how so obviously like the reading touches on racism and like class and a lot of like over sexualization but I think I just think it's crazy how readings like that show just how much uh history has influenced us even like today yeah. um it amazes me every single time uh but yeah <laughs> sorry that's pretty much it no, thank you Gabby. um you know <laughs> um I was really profoundly struck by you saying that men leave live to please other men right and it's, it's so true and, and I, I, I and, and for me now I don't not so much because I'm, I'm older right like so I really don't and I'm really never been one to think care what other people think but you do see that and it made me think about like high school right like you're only going to find a girl attractive who everyone finds attractive right so you're not going to find like what they may call that diamond or rough who may be a little bit different because you're afraid you get clowned for by your by your boys, right? So um, that that brings up a, a very good point, and we, especially when you connect it to notions of colorism, right? Because um, regardless of how beautiful I think this woman is, right, a society does not echo the way that she's viewed viewed as beautiful, and that's gonna make me not feel as comfortable in viewing her as beautiful, right? So yeah, that, that's a very good point. Um, we have one more. Um, Ready? Are you ready to go, Kayla? I know you had dropped out. Are you ready? To yeah, I'm ready. So the story in general, I found it interesting on the way that it was written based on the white man's point of view and a cop nevertheless. So he was most likely in like, front of every fight, this would say. Like how you said, he didn't understand why they would give him a hard time when, when he would treat them in a polite manner in a way sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, towards the end of the story, when he relives a memory of his younger self, when I was reading, was was happening at the picnic. I thought that it was since Jesse was a young kid when he witnessed it all was I thought it was like barbaric in a way. And his thoughts in the story as what the man did to, he wanted to understand what the man did to have that all happen to him at that moment. And it, I thought it wasn't until Jesse saw and felt in a way the amount of pride his people felt when it was all happening that he understood it as it doesn't matter what the man did and or didn't do. So just that it's normal that it, this was all happening in a way. 
Yeah, that's a great point. And, and, and you guys all picked up on it, and I'm glad you did. The perspective that the story was told from, right? Because most of the times when you hear about writings, readings, movies, about things like lynchings, it's always told from the victim standpoint, right? And, and you never really get to hear how the, um, the perpetrators of the terror are affected by this. And one thing about Baldwin, he has a wonderful ability to articulate how systems like racism not only affect people of culture, but they affect white people negatively also, right? And this is what's at play within this book, right? Um, it's not happenstance that he chose to write this book from the standpoint of Jesse, right? Who is, who's a white and a police officer as that, as Caleb put, points out, right? So it's almost a, a dual um, identity at play that's um, super authoritarian, right? So I have authoritarian just to do the, do the fact of my whiteness, and I have extra authoritarian because I'm the sheriff of the town, right? And so if you read underlying the theme of the story, right? You have an insurrection at play. They're organizing around voter registration, right? So this is why the Blacks on the side of town are, are in an uproar. So to deal with that, Jesse thinks back to a simpler time, right? To a time to where if a Black person gets out of line, we engage in a town picnic, right? This is what he's, and I believe what I'm sorry, she said, the fantasy, right? This is his fantasy. This is the white imagination at play, right? I can't control what's happening in my town now. I'm going to reflect and, re and imagine back to a time to where the way that we squashed an uproar is we engage in a lynching. And that put every black in this town on notice, right? Because you say, he says it, right? As they're driving up that hill, Jesse notices all the blacks is locked up in their house, right? So, so this whole, Really, it plays into this idea of make America great again, right? So Jesse is reflecting and reminiscing to a time that we're able to crush social uplift and racial upheavals by a simple lynching, right? And you see this play out within the pages of, of Baldwin's text. Um, let's open it up to class conversation. You guys did a phenomenal job with the fishbowl. I think you guys really elucidated some really um, poignant parts of the story. Um, yeah, I want to hear some other people's thoughts about the reading. It was a little, it was a little, I'm, I'm, I'll call it what it is, right? That shit was disturbing, right? Like that was, a, it was graphic and it was, it was fucking disturbing, right? Um, but it allows us to gauge, engage in this conversation around American history at a different capacity, right? Um, and again, it makes you think about not only how the victims are being affected, but how the victimizers become affected as well. Denise, what were your thoughts on the reading? Um, I can agree that with everything everyone said and that it was a bit disturbing of everything, but um, what I thought of the reading, um, it involved a lot of controversy, I think, and it was very descriptive. Um, and I kind of saw it as him just having, having like episodes of like a little bit of PTSD or anxiety throughout the end, kind of. But yeah. That, that, that's interesting, Denise. Um, that's very interesting. Uh, definitely, I see the PTSD and I see the anxiety, especially at the beginning of the story. But I think it's more played out from his job, right? From the way that he has to perform his duty as the sheriff. That's where the, the PTSD and the anxiety stems from. And the way that he combats the PTSD and the anxiety is thinking about his childhood, right? And, and what he witnessed during his childhood. So that, that's a very, um, very good point. Also, you mentioned the descriptive, right? And, and if y'all can't tell already, like Baldwin is one of my favorite writers, right? And it's because of his descriptiveness. He has an ability, and you guys talked about this in the um, in your fishbowl, how you were almost confused at first because he just like drops you in the middle of Jesse's bedroom and you don't really have no context. You're just in the middle of him not able to perform, right? 
and he kind of unfolds what's happening page by page, slowly but surely, till you get the full picture. But to me, the descriptions in Baldwin's writing is really what sets Baldwin apart from any other writers. And when we get into Baldwin next week and the fire next time, you'll see more of his descriptive nature. Um, any other thoughts about the reading? Anybody did not like the reading, that's fair too. Well, I agree that, um, well, I think that it's a good story. I do agree that it's disturbing um, because it is very descriptive. But then again, I think that the fact that it is descriptive is what makes it a good story because for example, like when he's explaining um, like the emotions of the of Jesse, like where I, I feel like it provides like a better sense or like context of who he is and like of his views of like his views in society, I guess. Um, because if I feel like if he weren't have to provide it or like that description, it would we would have been kind of um I feel like we could have had a, probably a different understanding of, of Jesse that wouldn't really have been correct. Like, I feel like his description really helps um, like provide context and get a better feeling for the story. And then also what I took from it is, I kind of just felt like, um, like Jesse's a white man who, who had like, um, what is it? He had like a lot of like contradicting emotions. I feel like I, fe I felt that I think deep inside him, like he knew that what he was doing was wrong or like, you know, the things that were happening in society were wrong. But then again, like his his community made made him made it look like it, what they were doing was good, like if it was all right. So it's kind of like even though he um, he felt um, like something negative, like if they were doing something that's negative at the same time, it's like his community is telling him that it's right so that he shouldn't feel like like he's doing something wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Angelica, did you want to kind of speak on what you placed in the chat? Um, yeah, so while she was describing that, I like when I was reading it, I immediately thought of Saver Complex where he believed it was his duty to protect the white people from the black people. So I think like the description really helped like um, convey that expression that he had. And I think it's also like one of like the main focal points in a lot of Baldwin's writings. Um, I've read, I think two other of his writings. So I've noticed that. Which ones, Angelica? Um, I've read Between the World and Me and I forgot which other one. I think it was like more of a short story. Okay. Yeah. Um, you, you're absolutely right. So, and when we pick up next week, you, you'll see the same kind of um, narrative themes play out. Um, one thing that that um, both, uh, I believe it was Natalia and Galilee mentioned, is the contradictions, right? And, and Natalia mentioned in the space of, you know, his town is saying this is acceptable behavior, but he feels that it's not, and it's kind of eating him up, right? But then Galilee speaks of the contradiction in the sense that, you know, we say that big butts are beautiful, but you don't like the women who naturally have big butts, right? You say that you don't like women and people with dark skin, but you're okay with white women who go tan, right? So these are contradictions at play. And one of the things that Baldwin does phenomenally is he's able to point out and poke holes in the contradictions of racism. Right. And, and this is both you, Natalia and, and Galilee, are picking up on these contradictions very astutely. Right. Um, so, so that's great. Let's um, I'll pose one last question. Um, Otis, what do you think? What do you think Otis's significance in this story was? Or the lack of his presence? Why is that significant? And what does it say about the parenting dynamics for Black parents and white parents? I feel like if Otis stayed around, then maybe Jesse wouldn't have turned out the way he was. Maybe he would have been like more insightful or maybe um, he would just grow into like the person that he, he was. But he, 
feel like a sense of guilt, but I'm not really sure. It just, it really just depends on your interpretation of it because it could be either or. You know, I didn't think about that, Angelica. That that's that's a good point too because it's like we never see Jesse and Otis interact or engage. It's just like a figment of his imagination almost, or like an old friend that he kind of lost ways with. So if you were able to maintain a relationship with Otis, you know, how would that impact his his him doing his job, or would he even decide to be a sheriff? Right, that's a very good point. Anybody else want to take a guess or stab at at Otis? There's no wrong answer. Um, I think that Otis was kind of like a figure of truth um, because I feel that um, Jesse's parents hid things from him. And I feel like Otis was the one who kind of revealed, like, I feel like hidden things to, um, to Jesse. Yep. So let me ask this question then. Why would it be that Otis would know those things and Jesse wouldn't? And, and you said it, Natalia, right? Jesse's parents kept stuff from him, right? But obviously Otis's parents aren't. Why are Otis's parents telling him these, these things? I think it's because it's something that his own community is like suffering from. So his parents are like, his parents are showing or teaching Otis like what's really happening because I think that for example, Jesse's parents, like they, they're making things they make things seem as if they're okay when in reality they're not. And I feel that that's like Otis's parents, they're teaching their kids so they can know what's really going on and that it's not correct. Yep. And right, it's for survival, right? Because yeah. if Otis doesn't know these things, Otis could very well be that individual in the tree, right? So there's this book I read um, for my education program. It's called The First R. And the book is a case study. And it's a case study on um, students as from kindergarten to first grade, okay? And what she's studying is how these children perform race, right? And then how, when racial act, actions happen, how do the schools deal with those actions, right? So nine times out of 10, they will call the parent in, right? Of the child who said the racist statement or whatever the case may be. And the parent always responds with, well, they didn't learn that in my home, right? We didn't teach them that. We don't even talk about race in my house. This is typically the white parents, how they respond to things, right? But for the children of culture, their parents don't respond that way, right? In the households for children of culture, conversations of racism are very prevalent because again, it's about survival, right? White parents have the luxury not to tell them these things. They have the privilege not to tell them these things because these things don't, won't cost them their life, right? But for Otis, for my kids, right? For me growing up, we had to have the conversations on how you um, interact with the police officers, right? How do you interact? Don't go on that side of town at this hour, right? So these are conversations that must be had for survival, right? Um, so it's, it's the old adage that the talk for black kids and, ki and children of culture is vastly different from the talk for white kids, right? They're talking about the birds and the bees. Our, our parents are talking about how to make it home safe at night, right? Um, how many of you guys in your household conversations around race are, are something that takes place? My family does. Yeah. I would say probably the vast majority, right? Um, and, and it's funny because even me growing up, like it wasn't a focal point. Like my parents didn't really focus on race a lot. Um, they were more so, they were, they were Christian. So that was like the, the bare minimum. If it wasn't within the page of the Bible, they wasn't really too interested. But for me, um, because I was like, I moved from Pomona to Rancho, right? So these are two vastly different social demographics, right? So Pomona, is the last city in LA County. Typically when motherfuckers get in trouble in LA, they move to Pomona to escape trouble. So a lot of the LA activities, you would find them in Pomona, right? A lot of the people from LA you find in Pomona, right? So for me, like what, first through fifth grade, it had a certain particular demographic to it. And I moved to Rancho Cucamonga, right? Um, suburban, uh, high to middle class, you know, um, kids are, 
the parents are wealthy, right? Um, a lot more white kids, right? So where in Pomona, you may have two white kids in the class period, right? In Rancho, you are one of two only black kids in the class. And you lucky if you have an indigenous homeboy that you can link up with the class or, or an Asian homeboy that you can link up in the class or Arab homeboy that you can link up in the class. Other than that, it's all white, right? So I had to have these conversations around race because of what I was going through. Right. So we don't again, it's the, ha the not having the luxury to not talk about these things or to ignore these things. It can literally mean life or death. And this is what Baldwin is doing with Otis's character. That's why Jesse could go to Otis to get answers for things that he does not know about because his parents aren't telling him that. But Otis's parents is damn sure telling him that because they want to make sure that Otis comes home every night. Right. Um, any last comments, questions? We'll take one more and we'll call it a day. Uh, you wanna you wanna speak on that, Kaylin, if if you can, if your uh, internet will allow you to, because I, I think you're right. Oh, I was just saying how this whole text kind of reminded me of like another topic well it's kind of connected but not really about how white people um had to go outsource i'll say outsource and find people to do their uh, their job which is agriculture and building basically building their country for them so i was talking about how i was thinking about how uh white men must have felt to see a black person or any other person for that matter be competent enough to take care of their business in their country and their stuff and how they basically punished black people for uh, for it and one of the things that they've done and not many people know of was basically embarrass them um not a lot of people know that white men uh, some white men even raped black men in front of everybody and there was this process where they would uh, they would pair a black man and their mother to have you know to have sex and have children with each other and not a lot a lot of people know that and they used to be embarrassed uh, they used to get embarrassed they used to be hanged they used to um have their clothes taken off, whatever it was, to embarrass them and put them in their place because white people felt like I'm superior to you and you're not gonna make me feel like I'm incompetent. So yeah. that's what I thought about. Yeah, and then this notion of buck breaking, right? Um, so when Caitlin talks about how white men would break African enslaved men, right? This, that's what you talk called buck, buck breaking. So in the Caribbean, um, what we would call in our culture and our society homophobic. They're very, very homophobic in the Caribbean. But that is because of this phenomenon of bug breaking, right? So if you come from a culture where you've seen your grandfathers and your uncles in, assaulted in this way, right? You're gonna have a very distinct way of looking at men and men related sexually, right? That's gonna traumatize you, right? So when you think about the, um, again, what we would call homophobia that comes out, especially like dance hall music, um, newer reggae music, right? There's a lot of anti-homosexual language in that music, but that stems from this phenomenon of buck breaking, right? And, and these are one of those things to where um, as society is becoming more um, inclusive, right? And, and it's becoming more aware of social ills, you can't forget about the history of some aspects of, of society that causes these divisions, right? So for me, I'm not as quick to jump on someone from the Caribbean's throat who may say something homophobic because I understand that history, right? Like, I can't lie to you. I might think that way too if I it came from a community that had to go through those types of things, right? You're not gonna have a positive outlook. You're not gonna have a nuanced outlook on homosexual activity as it pertains to men when you know that history, right? So again, we uh, to me, it's always um, historical contexts are very important, right? Because if you don't have a historical context, you could just perceive um, Caribbean culture as just being homophobic when it's a lot deeper 
essence is going on within there. And I'm not excusing or justifying homophobia, but again, to have context to why things are, you know, it, to understand a why behind something is a very powerful tool, right? Um, so let's do this. I wanna show you guys what we'll be reading for next week and we'll call it a day. Bear with me while I pull that up on our screen real quick. And if you guys do have any questions, feel free to shoot them off while I get this pulled up. And I promise you uh, next week's reading of Baldwin, it's not gonna be as graphic. It's gonna be a little more, <laughs> a little, a little more normal. Okay, so for next week, um, classwork. Yes, so it will be the one at the bottom, a letter to my nephew. This is also James Baldwin. This is from the book Fire Next Time. Um, this is the opening letter um, that he wrote to his nephew um, that was talked about in the uh, video that we watched to start off class. Um, only eight pages. But, but read it attentively, because it's a lot of good material within these eight pages. So that will be your reading for next week. Um, matter of fact, when we end class today, I will send that reading out to the group so that way you guys have one. Um, far as spring break, uh, we have next week's, we meet next week, and then after next week is spring break. Correct, am I? Yeah, so we'll meet and talk about um, Baldwin Fire next time. Uh, you guys will have spring break. When you come back, we'll have um, our midterm review, and then that following week will be the midterm. Um, any other questions, comments, or concerns? 